So the UK's freshwater fish species, um, depends what you read. We've got somewhere between 50 and 60 species of fish that are found in freshwater. Some of the lists include fish that are probably primarily marine, but drift into freshwater. For example, some of the mullets, bass, flounder, that sort of stuff. Of that community of 50 or 60 species, about 12 of them are introduced from abroad. Uh, we've got species from North America, from continental Europe um, that have been brought here for a variety of reasons. For example, for recreational purposes, things like the Wales catfish or zander, for food, things like the rainbow trout, and then some that have probably come with the ornamental trade and then escaped into the wild. Interestingly, we have one or two of those in the Test Valley. So yeah, the chalk streams have a very diverse fish community by and large. Um, not all chalk streams have 50 or 60 species, but they may well have 20 or 30 species. And you generally find that the closer you are to centres of population, then the greater the diversity of that community. And one of the great places for finding odd, weird and wonderful fish species is uh, around London. For example, the area north of London up the Colne Valley. And that is because there's lots of angling waters there. There's lots of domestic properties where people think, oh, I'll just let my goldfish go. And they lob them out into the river, for example. In the case of our local chalk streams, things like the test, this is a pie chart that I took from a friend at the Environment Agency called Dom Longley, um, which is the result of some electric fishing work on the test. And it's uh, the community of fish species represented by number on this pie chart. And there's a few things that are quite interesting here because the fish community of the test, according to this survey of Dom's, Three quarters of it is made up of three species. And then everything else is sort of fairly low level stuff, but it is quite interesting. And also over, sorry, nearly half of the fish community comprises two very, very small fish indeed, i.e. the minnow and the bullhead, both of which are about the size of, well, probably your little finger, maybe your thumb in the case of the bullhead. Um, bullheads particularly are incredibly important and rarely seen in river communities, incredibly important animals. And then on top of that, we've got a few weird and wonderful things, uh, for example, in the test, and I've listed them alphabetically, none of which are, with one exception, possibly the rudd and the two, two exceptions, rudd and crucian carp are, oh, and tench with E3, um, are genuinely native. So the others are introduced more or less and they occur in greater or lesser numbers so there are numbers of rainbow trout that are released into the river for angling purposes and there are very small numbers of things like wells catfish which are probably in lakes rather than the river so i spoke about the importance top right of the miller's thumb the bullhead as I said earlier on, a big bullhead is about the size of your thumb. Very small individuals, but incredibly important and incredibly interesting fish, as I hope I'll demonstrate later on. And then running down that right hand column, rainbow trout introduced from North America to the UK, maybe late 18th century, something like that. The European eel and then in the bottom right hand corner, the common carp introduced from continental Europe who knows, maybe by the Romans, but certainly hundreds and hundreds of years ago. The thing we have very few of in the Testanich and Valleys is the Wells catfish, which is the bottom left hand corner. And that's my colleague, Tim Jacklin, catching a giant one from the River Ebro in Spain. But luckily we don't have fish of that scale yet, certainly in these two valleys. They are elsewhere in the UK at 50 or 60 kilos or possibly bigger than that too. My first fish that I'd like to talk about, unsurprisingly, is uh, the brown trout, because I come from the Wild Trout Trust and uh, they are a particular passion of mine. Let's talk a little bit about the life cycle, because the life cycle of the brown trout is incredibly interesting and also quite telling for a variety of environmental reasons. It's a great bellwether is the brown trout. Their spawning biology involves upstream migration to find suitable places to spawn. 
This is a fish on the Sussex Ooze, which isn't a chalk stream. It's a male sea trout. Brilliant photo by Paul Sharman, muscling its way over a weir at um, Barkham on the Sussex Ooze. And he is going upstream looking to find a mate. This is, these are fish on a chalk stream. This is not in Hampshire. This is the Cam at Cambridge. The male fish is the top one. He's smaller, but he's more colourful. And the female fish is the lower one, the slightly bigger fish. And the general philosophy is that the larger your body size, the more eggs you can pack in. And obviously for trout and lots of other organisms, females are the really important gender. Um, and that's very much the case in trout. So the females tend to get bigger, which means they can develop more eggs and thus hopefully they can produce more offspring. They cut nests in the gravel. This is on the top end of the test. And that oval of cleaned gravel that you can see in the middle of the photograph is a red. I know you've done some red, some of you have done some red training with Andy Thomas identifying these things, but that's an absolute cracker of a red. As you can see, it's about a meter long, maybe half a meter side to side. There is a relationship between the size of the red and the size of fish that cut it. And if we make it really ballpark, a fish cuts a red about three times its body length. So here, this fish having cut a, let's say a three foot long red, let's, lose, let's use imperial measures. That's maybe a foot long fish or maybe a little bit bigger that's cut that red. Uh, they tend not to put all their eggs in one basket. So henfish will cut a number of reds and scatter her eggs around. And that obviously makes complete ecological and evolutionary sense. She uses her tail as a spade effectively to cut a hole in the gravel, deposits her eggs in there, which are fertilized externally by a male. And then she moves upstream, uses her tail again as a shovel to flick gravel back on top of them. So in a completed red like this, the eggs are buried in the downstream mound of the red, but probably into the face of it, so that nice, cool, oxygenated water is percolating through the gravel and incubating those baby eggs. And then in the case of brown trout, they become what are called eyed embryos within about four or five weeks, a month, say. And in these eggs, this particular egg, the one in the middle of the shot here, you can see very clearly an eye looking at you, the dark circle. And if you look very closely, you can see the other eye on the other side of the head, which is just obliquely down to the left of the most visible eye. And then the embryo is wrapped around a massive yolk sac in those eggs. The size of the egg is proportional to the female that laid it. And for brown trout, most eggs will be kind of two, three millimeters in diameter, that kind of size. An absolutely whopping trout might lay eggs that are five millimetres in diameter. The spawning biology of salmon is very similar and a very, very big salmon might lay eggs anything up to seven or eight millimetres in diameter. So that's the size of a pea. Uh, they're whopping great eggs. And they sit in the gravel and they incubate for, in the case of brown trout, six or seven weeks. The incubation period is temperature dependent so chalk streams in southern England tend to have the most rapid fertilisation to hatching phase. The further north you go, so for example, up into Scotland, where the water temperatures are colder, incubation takes much longer and could be double that, for example, in the case of a brown trout. What hatches out of the egg is this very crude looking fish. Six or seven weeks after fertilisation, this thing hatches out, which is technically called an alevin. So it's an embryonic fish. If you look very closely at this photograph, you can see some absolutely incredible detail. So you can see the big orangey yolk sac hanging off the fish's belly, which is obviously going to give it nutrition through the early stages of its life. Um, you can see the eye on the head of the fish here to the right hand side, obviously. If you look immediately behind the eye, you can see the gills developing here on this fish. If you can see my cursor, those are the gills of the developing fish. And then running down here is the spine of the fish. Very clearly visible if you are looking at this animal close up. And underneath it, the dorsal aorta, the main blood vessel of the fish. And then underneath that again, this dark strip is the kidney of the fish. All developing in this 
tiny little animal. This guy is about two centimeters long, something like that. They look more like an eel at this stage with a big fat yolk sac attached to them because all the fins here are a single strip of tissue running around the fish. And then rather like in humans where our fingers start out as a connected paddle effectively. And in, in humans, the skin between the fingers dies. The same happens in fish. So spaces develop where that flap of tissue dies and leaves individual fins, for example, the anal fin back here, the caudal fin or the tail, as it's called, the dorsal fin up here. So that guy there will spend about another month in the gravel living off its yolk sac. And then out comes uh, baby trout. So these fish now are about 25 millimeters long, so about an inch, let's say. And you can see very clearly here that they've developed fins. They've got a nice fin on the back. They've got all their belly fins. They've got a big broad tail there at the back. Now, they are incredibly vulnerable animals. They have got three immediate requirements. They need to get out of the flow because they're so small they can't swim against rapid flow. They need to get away from predation because they are eaten by pretty well everything, including their own parents. And they need to find food. And just to demonstrate that point, this is a baby trout that was caught by accident by somebody river fly sampling on the river Wandle in South London. And as I said, they're incredibly yummy to just about everything. The three things that they need to do, I get out of the flow, avoid predation and find food. They do all of those things at the margin of the river. It's incredibly important. One of the things that we can learn from this about river management is that shaggy rivers, so rivers with lots of vegetation around the edges and growing into the margins, are really important for fish fry. So I just, as a gimmick, stuck my little trout fry in there, but that's where they tuck away. They can find food, they can avoid predation, and they can get out of the flow. So tidy rivers, where people go and drag all this stuff out, are absolute suicide for juvenile fish, and in fact, for lots and lots of invertebrate species, because it's at the edges where the magic happens in rivers. And actually that's a broader ecological truism. This slide demonstrates how yummy baby trout are. One of my nocturnal activities is I'm a fish parasitologist and people bring me fish to health check, fish farmers bring me fish to health check before they then go and stock them out. So in this particular episode, a friend of mine down in Dorset uh, was bringing me some fish to health check from his fish farm. And when he got to my house, he said, Look, I'm really sorry, I've got the yearlings in there, the bigger one in this photograph, but I can't find the fry that I put in the transport tank. I think they're hiding underneath the aeration plate. Anyway, you can guess where the story's going here because I found the fry despite the fact that these had been in a transport tank on the back of a pickup driving from the other side of Dorchester to my house in Chandler's Ford, the larger fish, as you can see, these sort of eight inch long brown trout, thought the smaller fish were so yummy that they ate them. And that was true of all of the larger fish that I had in the sample, which is a really interesting demonstration of how yummy little trout are and so how risky life is. The larger fish in this photograph was electric fished from the river Itchin, uh, just north of Winchester, in October, so just after the end of the fishing season. And what was found in its gut was this baby wild trout, which you can see is still absolutely immaculate condition, still beautiful, had been swallowed whole by the larger fish. This is a fish that stocked for fishing purposes, the big one. This was a wild fish that was bred in the river. So even when you're, in this case, kind of three or four inches long, you're still at great risk, including from your own kind. And so it goes on because even larger trout get eaten by other larger trout. So this fish was found moribund on the river Kennet, very likely choked by eating another trout. 
So the tail that you can see poking out of this fish's mouth is a trout that's about a foot long and maybe about a pound in weight. And it had been or attempted to be swallowed by a fish about four pounds in weight. So this is what was removed. So here's that same big fish. Um, you can see from its eye that actually it's only very, very recently died this bigger fish. But this is what came out of it. So even though it's a foot long fish, probably three years old, the big guy tried to swallow it and it cost him very, very dear. Life for a trout is tricky. Predation is only one of the many risks that they face. But as a consequence, their survival rates are really low. So these are some fish that I electric fished from the river done many years ago, i.e. the test done. What I didn't do was put the scale on these, but the bottom fish is about six inches long. The second bottom fish is about eight inches long, maybe 10. The third one up is 12 inches long. And the one at the top is a male and he's about 14 inches long, something like that in old money. So I know that the one at the top is a four-year-old. The next one down is a three-year-old. The second from bottom is a two-year-old and the one at the bottom is a one-year-old. And their survival rates are really, really poor. So about, let's say, a thousand eggs hatch in the gravel. About 50 of those thousand hatchlings can expect to reach their first birthday. Of those 50 that survived, to their first birthday, about half of those, 25 of the original thousand cohort, can expect to survive till two. About half of that again, so 12 or 13, can expect to survive till three. And then about half a dozen can expect to survive to four. The thing that's really important about that is that most male trout, not all, but most, most male trout probably sexually mature at two. If you're a female, you are probably three or possibly four until you sexually mature. So in this cohort of a thousand fish that started life, and bear in mind only half of this 12 are girls, you've only got about six females that survive till sexual maturation out of a cohort of a thousand fish. The thing that that says to me is that Every girl, in fact, probably every fish is sacred if you want to sustain a trout population. Catch and kill angling is definitely not the thing to do for wild trout because they just don't tolerate high levels of catch and kill fishing. And this is the reason, because so few survive through to sexual maturity just from natural wastage, predation, starvation, displacement, whatever it happens to be. This is a photograph from the Itchin just above Winchester. Absolutely exemplifies everything that a trout might need in its life. So its spawning gravels are down by the swan, this area here. There's loads and loads of scruffy margins for the babies to tuck up in when they hatch and get out of the flow, find food, escape predation. And then as they grow, they're looking for increasingly deep water which, for example, is provided here on the right hand side in the foreground by this deeper pool on the outside of the bend. It's possible that a trout would spend its entire life within that reach of river that you can see uh, in that photograph. So some trout are incredibly homey. Other trout are much more errant. And of course, there are evolutionary drivers that push some fish to go and kind of spread their seed. It all makes complete sense. Some fish migrate as far as the sea. And one of the things we're increasingly finding out about trout, which is absolutely intriguing, is that the errant ones, the ones that wander, wander all over the place. They might wander the full length of a river, but stay in the river. But they might also nose out a bit out to sea. They might mooch around in the estuary and then come back into fresh water. Or they might go out into the coastal waters. Of these two fish here, they're anaesthetized rather than dead, by the way. The lower one is a sea trout and the upper one is a salmon and they are wearing their livery for going to sea. So these are the stage of the life cycle called smolts. They've silvered up, so they've got the camouflage for sea 
which lots of sea fishes have, your herrings, your mackerels, your sprats. And they've also changed their physiology to cope with moving from freshwater to saltwater. So lots and lots of really complex physiological processes going on to drive that switch from freshwater to saltwater. So our trout, as I said earlier on, they primarily feed in coastal waters, but your salmon does a whole oceanic job. So fish coming from our part of the world down here in central southern England and making one of two probable journeys, they may migrate up into the North Atlantic around the Faroes. And if they do that journey, they probably spend one winter in that vicinity, winter feeding in the ocean. But some will migrate all the way across the Atlantic to the west coast of Greenland and feed there. And those fish probably stay there for two, three, maybe even four years feeding at sea before they return the journey back here to the UK. So the short journey, if they go to the Faroes, is 1,500 miles. And if they choose to go all the way across the Atlantic, they're making a 3,000 mile journey across the Atlantic to the west coast of Greenland. These guys going to the Faroes tend to come back after a single winter at sea, and they're what's commonly called in salmon parlance, grills, G-R-I-L-S-E. And they would be maybe four to six, seven pounds in weight. But the guys that cross the ocean, the longer they stay at sea, the bigger they get. So a fish that's had a couple of winters at sea would come back to fresh water as maybe a 10 or 12 pounder. Three winter fish, maybe a 20 pounder, and a four winter fish is going to be a giant 30, 40 pounders, that sort of size. We are blessed on the test and itching to have environment agency run fish counters run by a guy called Dom Longley. And they are generating some incredibly interesting information on our local populations of salmon and sea trout, which quite possibly are genetically unique. Uh, so this is the latest data that Dom's published from the counters, in this case, at the bottom end of the test. And the dark blue line here is the run of salmon that have come past his counter. And the numbers are very, very low at the moment. And you possibly can see why, because the driver that brings them into freshwater is a lot of water in the river. They look for that cue before they decide to charge up. And the blue line here is the flow in the river test compared to the 10 year mean, which is this line here, the top dashed line. So the test is running pretty low. Now that may be one of the reasons why the salmon haven't swum into it yet, or it could be that we're facing a grotty year for salmon. The blue shaded area is the six year range for the numbers of fish. And you can see that this year is at the bottom edge of that range. I mean, things can change because a good lift of water, there might be fish sitting out there and suddenly this blue line jumps up to meet the five year average, which is this one, well, I'm sorry, color blind, I don't know what color that line is there, but it may not yet be a disaster. It could be a bad year, but things might change if there are fish sitting out there ready to jump in. The next thing is to look at another, I suppose, iconic chalk stream fish, the grayling. They are pretty common in both the test and the itching, but they're introduced to both, probably. There are records that suggest that grayling were introduced to the test uh, maybe the late 19th century and to the itching possibly as late as the early 20th century. The perceived wisdom is that they're by and large native to eastern flowing rivers, so the Thames catchment and on up the eastern side of the country. Although there is some debate about whether there might be other native populations. They are amazing fish and they're, they're a fish that has gone through the most extraordinary metamorphosis in terms of how people perceive them in the chalk streams. They were introduced here with a view to them being a winter sport fish because you're allowed to catch them during the trout spawning season in the winter because they're a spring spawning species. But then they became sort of persona non grata amongst the chalk stream angling fraternity. And when I came to the chalk streams in the mid eighties, 
We used to go out electric fishing, literally thousands of these fish in a day and killing them, burying them in pits beside the river because they simply weren't wanted. The trout fishermen hated them. They rose to the trout fishermen's flies and suddenly they were catching grayling when they thought they were catching a trout. And the thing has completely shifted again now. So you can pay maybe £75 for a day's grayling fishing on the test and indeed the itching. And they're revered. There is a dedicated grayling society of adorers of grayling. And they are the most extraordinary fish. They're simply beautiful. This is a whopper of a grayling. If you know your fish, this one is three pound 10. It's a massive big male, came from the Dorset Froom. And I know it's a male because it's got this beautiful ornate dorsal fin on its back, which has got all sorts of apparently courtship cues for female grayling to think that he's absolutely the business when he wanders into their patch. I said earlier on, they're spring spawning fish. So they do something vaguely similar to trout in that they build a sort of red in the gravel. But instead of doing it in the winter, like a trout, they do it in March or April. A grayling red looks like this. So this is a size 10 wader here. And here about a sort of dinner plate or slightly bigger grayling red. They're rather careless. They, they don't build such an elaborate nest as a trout. They tend to scrape a hole in the gravel, very shallow hole, and then they lay the eggs just a couple or three or four centimetres down into the gravel, and then they cover them over again. So as a consequence, grayling eggs, like any buried in this gravel, can be very, very vulnerable to spring flooding. And as we see the effects of climate weirdness and we are seeing both very dry springs like the one we've had now but also some very wet ones a seasonal flooding can really really decimate grayling populations and that's because the eggs are very shallowly buried in here and a big lift of water washes the gravel away and takes grayling eggs with them but these are baby grayling and again um, you can see the same stuff so this big fat yolk sack attached to the belly you can very clearly see the individual vertebrae on the spine here. Isn't that fantastic? Look at that. Two eyes on the head. And you can see, I think possibly most clearly on this fish here, the one over here, you can see this strip of primeval fin that's more like an eel than it is a grayling. And, and also here, you can see the, the main blood vessel that's running underneath the spine. If you can see my pointer, it's running here. Underneath that, the darker line is the kidney of the fish. There is one other thing you can see too, which I, I find absolutely fascinating, which is if you look just behind its eyes in this vicinity here, you can see its ear bones. So we have the same kind of ear bones as a fish. And in juvenile fish like this, you can see them very clearly, with an, even with the naked eye. And then this is a, a baby grayling. So just as the trout I showed you earlier on, this is a fish that's maybe, oh, they're tiny, they're maybe 12 millimetres long, absolutely minuscule little thing, incredibly vulnerable. This is about the only stage of the life cycle of the grayling that uses marginal cover. Um, the messy stuff, the shaggy stuff that I said earlier on is incredibly important for rivers. Because again, they have the same needs. They've got to get out of the flow. They've got to avoid predation and they've got to find food. And these are yearling grayling. No, they're, they're not yearling. Well, they probably had a summer. So it's the back end of the summer. And you can see they're about eight centimeters long. I think they're incredibly beautiful fish. About now, if you look on the, the riffles, the shallow parts of the local chalk streams, and there are grayling in that vicinity, you'll be seeing these guys in shoals. They're very strong shoal fish pretty much throughout their lives really, but certainly when they're babies and they live on the, on the riffles on the shallow water. And so if you're seeing fish that are about this time of year, seven, eight, 10 centimeters long, then there's a good chance that they're grayling juveniles. And they like trout grow to Typically, they're starting to die at four or five years old of old age. 
but they might live to eight, maybe even a little bit longer than that. This is another gigantic male grayling from the River Dove, so it's not a chalk string like up in Derbyshire in this case. Um, fish of three odd pounds in weight, huge fish, spectacular animal. And there's quite a lot of talk, particularly in the test in itching, about whether grayling are competitive with brown trout. And that's the reason that they were persecuted when they were, really. Um, so I, I sort of looked at the habitat, the ecological requirements of both fishes. And really, there's quite a lot of differentiation in the sorts of habitat they use, the speed of water they live in, after about the first year of life. So they spawn in similar places, but they then sort of they sort of segregate a little bit so competition is probably not a massive issue for trout and grayling certainly not what we thought it was in our slightly uneducated um, younger years i took this scale of grayling that's about 30 centimeters and i took it off it in november that's a harmless procedure the fish was alive went back fine and dandy and the bit that you see on the flank of the fish is the top third up here. Uh, this has got skin still attached to the scale. And you can see individual pigment cells, the little black spots in the skin that overlies the scale. The bulk of the scale, so the lower two thirds of it, is embedded in the skin of the fish. So you can't see that when you look at the flank of the fish. But the way to age them is very similar to the old tree ringing principle. In the case of grayling, like trout, they grow at very similar rates. A given year class will grow at very similar rates and they grow pretty quickly. And there's a strong differentiation between their summer growth phases and their winter growth phases. The scale grows proportional to the length of the fish. So when the fish is growing quickly, its scale grows quickly, i.e. when there's lots of food in the summer, spring. And when things get a bit tight in the late autumn and the winter, the fish grows more slowly and so does each of its scales. And that pattern is reflected on each of its scales. So if I start here in the spring with this grayling, right in the middle of the scale here, it hatches out, shall we say in April, and it goes through its first summer, which you can see on this scale represented by wide spacing between the fine dark lines. This kind of area here is this fish's first summer. So out here, this animal would have been about the seven, eight centimeter fish that you saw on one of the earlier slides. And then it starts to move into its first autumn. The fish is growing more slowly and so is its scales. And so the fine lines on the scale start to bunch up and they produce this dark band, which is the fish's first winter. And then it comes out of its first winter into its second spring and summer. And you can see very widely spaced darker rings here in this vicinity, coming out here, growing, growing, growing. And then it starts to hit its second autumn stroke winter here. So the space between the fine lines on the scale is closing up. So here's its second winter. It then comes out, breaks out into its third summer, spring and summer here, wide spacing between the fine lines on the scale. And then it hits its third winter out here. And then I whipped the scale off the fish. So I know from looking at this fish that this is one year old, two year old, and not yet hit its third birthday. So it's about two and a half, maybe two and three quarter years old. And 30 centimeters will be absolutely classic for both trout and grayling at that sort of age. Dead interesting, I hope you agree. Oh yeah, sorry, here, I'll put these things on. So age one with the, the inner yellow arrow, age two, the outer yellow arrow, and then it's not yet hit its third birthday. One of the things that grayling are very good at is getting infected with worms. So a trout for that matter. This is the gut of a, a grayling that I've opened up and I found absolutely loads of tiny little worms. They look like small maggots. If 
you look at the bottom of this picture, you can see uh, the tip of my forceps here. So you're looking about maybe a centimeter long, and they're a very common parasite of a range of riverine fish species, grayling, trout, chub, barb, all that sort of stuff. They are called spiny headed worms, and that's because they have a spiny head. This is a particular one called Pomphorhynchus, um, which is quite a nasty parasite actually. So this is the maggoty bit you saw here, poking out into the gut of the fish. And this is the proboscis that they use to drive into the gut wall to hold them in place. If you look at it under a scanning electron microscope, that front end of that worm looks like this. So the maggoty bit is down to the right hand side. And then here's this amazing spiny head or spiny proboscis on the worm, which is what attaches it into the gut wall of its host. This one, the nasty one, Pomphoringus, has got um, a pneumatic, so a pneumatic bulb, sorry, I've got there in the end. It's a device that's designed to drive the proboscis into the gut wall. This thing it can use to squeeze and squeeze out the proboscis to drive it into the gut wall of the fish and anchor it in place. And then it hangs out into the lumen of the gut, the space of the gut, and just absorbs the nutrients from the fish. Yummy. The very clever thing about some of the spiny headed worms is that they use freshwater shrimps, gammas, many of you will know it, as an intermediate host. They're trying to get into the fish but they've reasoned that a good way to get into the fish is to get eaten by something that the fish likes to eat. And fish love freshwater shrimps. This orange spot at the top here of this gamut is a larva of that worm that you saw earlier on. The worm knows that fish home in on orange. It's a trigger color for fish. So if they see a freshwater shrimp with an orange spot in it, they are disproportionately attracted to it. They'll eat it, and then the worm will move from the shrimp to infest the fish. And anglers use this in mimicking flies with a very simple thing, an orange bead tied into a freshwater shrimp pattern. So this is the angler's imitation of the previous thing you saw. This fish was caught on the test uh, earlier this week, and this is the photograph down its throat, which you can see is absolutely stuffed with freshwater shrimps. Isn't that incredible? So uh, the freshwater shrimp gamerus forms an absolutely staple diet for trout, for grailing a whole heap of other animals. And they are obviously selectively just going through and grazing fish out in vast quantities. This animal had virtually a handful of freshwater shrimps inside it quite extraordinary. Can't see any there with a bright orange spot in them, but uh, not that I've looked close enough yet. So there's a whole pile of other fish, other than your salmon, your trout, your grayling, that live primarily in still waters adjacent to our rivers, but you will find them in both the rivers, in both the test and the itching. So things like tench top left, pike top right, perch bottom right, carp bottom left, and then fish that are primarily riverine fishes. So barbel, which are introduced to both the test and the itch, and they're not native to either river. Chub, probably introduced, not sure, less sure about that one. Dace, probably native, and gudgeon, certainly native. So in terms of their ecology, these fish are a little bit different to your salmonids, to your trout and your salmon, in that they produce mostly very large numbers of eggs, which are absolutely minuscule. And they work on the premise that if they produce enough eggs, probably one or two, ideally two babies, will survive to continue their lineage. It's a policy that is used by quite a lot of fishes and indeed other animals just to chuck loads and loads of eggs out there and just hope that a couple of them make it through. I've dissected this carp, which is a reasonably big fish, as you can see. It's maybe seven kilos. 
So it's about, let's say, 15 pounds in weight. She's very obviously a girl. So when I dissect away one of her belly flaps, she's got these enormous ovaries inside, which in species like carp and tench may comprise over 30% of her entire body weight may be put to eggs. So you can see there that together it's something, you know, probably not a whole pile off the size of a rugby ball. But if you can bear to look at the detail, you'll see that the individual eggs are absolutely tiny. So in a fish like this, which is 15 pounds in weight, a great big lump of a carp, the individual eggs are about a millimetre in diameter. So she works on that principle. She's going to chuck a lot of them out there and hope that one or two make it through. And when they do, if they do, these are carp fry. Most of the carp family of fishes, so the coarse fishes, have got very, very accelerated incubation phases. Um, in things like our common carp, depends on water temperature, so the warmer the water, the quicker they mature, they develop. But you may be talking about a week of incubation time. In species like grass carp, you can almost count that in hours. So they may go from fertilization to a hatchling like this in possibly a day and a half. But what hatches is an incredibly primitive animal. This, if it survives, which is a, a very slim chance, this animal may grow into a 50 pound carp one day. But you can see the same kind of structure as we saw in the baby trout. So to the left hand side, two eyes, uh, near side, far side. The yolk sac, which is smaller because the animal's got a shorter developmental phase. The vertebrae of the spine running all the way back here. And you can see very clearly the bones that come off those vertebrae. The blood vessel running along underneath the spine. And look at that, those fantastic ear bones, three of them on each side. This is the cranial cavity where the brain sits. Not much of a brain in this a fish this side. Here, those three bones that form the ear bones um, of the fish. Amazing. They also have an additional thing, some of these coarse fishes, which they have a sticky pad on the head. They don't build a nest in the gravel, most of them, barbel do, but they just chuck these eggs out. They stick on vegetation, possibly stones. And when these larvae, the baby fish hatch out, they too stick on stuff like vegetation. So they have a sticky pad on the head to stick onto a bit of weed, for example to allow them to mature. That earlier hatchling that you saw is about the size of an eyelash, maybe a little bit more. But even when they're starting to feed on live animals, zooplankton, tiny weeny animals drifting around in the water, they're still very small animals indeed. So these are baby carp and they're about 10 millimeters long, 10 minutes, so less than a centimeter long, absolutely tiny. They are, madly cannibalistic they'll eat pretty well anything if it moves and if one has got a gape that is big enough to fit a brother or sister in they will eat it they have the same requirements as the baby trout that i spoke of earlier so they've got to get out of the flow they've got to get away from predation and they've got to find food those are their three urgent requirements but they tend to do it in a slightly different way because things like dace, chub, barbel look for shallow margins at the edge of the river. And this photograph I took on the Gloucestershire Colm in the Cotswolds. And this is absolutely fantastic habitat for baby riverine coarse fishes. It's shallow, it's super warm in the summer, and it will produce lots of zooplankton, which is the small animals that they can chomp on. There is a bizarre predator avoidance technique here as well, because the water is so shallow that actually probably very little other than possibly aquatic insect species can eat them. Maybe an egret would go through and pick them out. But a kingfisher, for example, would really struggle to fish in this water because this is only a couple of inches deep. If you were to look along the margins of this cattle drink here, you might just be able to see there's a dark area. That dark area is actually baby fishes. And if I zoom in on it, there they are. If I ring an area, all of those are baby fishes. They're there in their absolute thousands in the summer. They could be baby minnows, they could be chub, they could be dace, they could be barbel. 
and they work on the principle that they're more or less protected here in this hyper shallow water. It's very warm, which suits them fine and dandy. And then if they need to move elsewhere to avoid, for example, a predator, they can bolt into deeper water, maybe find a bit of food out there if there's not too much flow. And then they come back into the shallow water to warm up and get their metabolism really whizzing. And hopefully their growth rate really whizzing too. They can't cope with flow. This again is a, a really interesting graph that Dom Longley produced from some survey work on the Sussex Ooze. So it's not a chalk stream, but it makes the point beautifully. If something's the size of an eyelash, it can't cope with flow. So Dom's beautifully here demonstrated the inverse relationship between flooding of the river and survival of coarse fish. So the dashed blue line, I think it's two year mean, winter flow in the Sussex Ooze. So a very high flow year in 2002, 2001, very low flow year in 2006, pretty high again in the 10s, 11s, 2010s, 11s. And if you look, for example, at the numbers of juvenile dace, there's a really clear inverse relationship. So the numbers of juvenile dace plummet when winter flows are high because the animals get washed away. And when winter flows are low, the animals survive. And the same is true of spring water levels. So if those tiny fish, 10, 15, 20 millimeters in length, meet weird winter flooding, they disappear. They get washed away and die. So as a consequence, you really see that many coarse fish species like barbel, chub, dace, roach, have got very spiky populations. Good years, which are almost certainly related to low flows when they were young, and then bad years, which are floody years. And you can see that later in life where you've got these big gaps in the population from certain year classes that were missing from years of flooding. But when they survive, they do incredibly well because they produce so many eggs. They can be incredibly fecund animals. And this is a net that I pulled with some students around the lake at Broadlands on the test. You can see, I mean, there, there are probably two tons of fish in there. It took us four hours in the January day to sort this lot out. But there's bream, there's roach, there's carp in that net, perch, all sorts of things in vast, vast numbers. And included in that net was this little beauty, which is a yearling pike. So this animal was spawned in probably March or April of the previous year. And it's a little bit under a year old when I hoiked it out of that net. It's a little bit longer than my hand. It's maybe 10 inches in length and yet to reach its first birthday. I adore these fish. I think they're one of our most amazing animals in terms of their anatomy, their physiology, the features they've got to do the job they do in life. But not everybody has the same view of pike. This used to be a really common scene. Thankfully, it no longer is. For many years, pike were heavily persecuted, particularly on the trout fishing chalk streams because they were, it was thought that they would eat all the trout. It was fairly common to find trophies like this nailed onto trees and various other places around fisheries. But things have changed, rather like the grayling, pike and now have monetary value and esteem. Um, there are people very keen to pay lots of money to fish for pike. So the perception is that, you know, pike are those monsters that eat everything that they can fit into their gobs. Well, that does actually become partially true later in life. But when they're small, they eat largely invertebrates. And then at some point when they're heading towards a year old and a foot long, they then start to have a little look at other fish to eat. So this is a pike that I dissected that came from Dorset, a lake in Dorset. Uh, it's, as you can see, 27 centimetres long, so it's a bit shy of a foot long. And there's its gut in the top of the photograph opened up. It's primarily been eating the water hoglouse, or cellus, which is what all of these corpses are up here. But tucks in amongst it is 
um, a baby roach that it swallowed in very, very good condition, as you can see. So they start life eating invertebrates and at some point their energetic requirements mean that they have to shift to something a bit more nutritious. But there are pike that at times of year would still very heavily feed on invertebrates. So they're opportunistic feeders like lots of things in life. And that opportunism might take them to taking things like mice or rats. So this rat down here in the bottom photograph came out of that pike. And this photograph um, just shows probably the final thing that, that rat saw, which is looking down a pike's throat. And they have an amazing array of teeth. So they have teeth which you can see at the edge of the jaw, these fairly large, big, spiky jobs. But then when you go into the mouth, they've got teeth on the tongue running all the way back down the throat. They've got teeth on the roof of the mouth, all of which point backwards. And they've got spines on the inside of their gill arches to stop prey getting back out. Everything in the mouth is directed towards getting prey into the gut and not allowing it to escape. I was fishing on Langorse Lake in South Wales many years ago, and I hooked a pike on a dead fish bait. And when I got it into the boat, there was the pike, which is about 18 pounds, with another pike poking out of its mouth, which turned out to be about three or four pounds in weight. So despite the fact that this fish had got a pike stuck in its throat, still in the process of being swallowed, it was still sort of focused enough on eating that it took my bait. That is not my bait, the big thing poking out of its mouth. Isn't that extraordinary? And they can grow very big. This is the day that I had uh, one of our Wild Trap Trust auction days with an angler on the itchin, and uh, he caught this absolute beauty that's about 24 pounds in weight massive big girl just like the trout in pike the very big fish are females so anything over about 10 pounds is almost certainly a female because she's got the mass the body mass to create lots and lots of eggs come spawning time and then in our fish community there are a whole bunch of these small things that have got incredible aspects of their life cycle the bullhead top left, a male minnow middle right in his spawning livery. This is the spring, possibly the summer, because they spawn several times in the spring and summer. And here, an adult brook lamprey. And there are some incredible stories among these things, including in the bullhead. So this is a bullhead. As I said now many times, it's an animal about the size of your thumb. A real whacker would be maybe the length of your longest finger, but bulkier than that. And one of the intriguing things about bullheads, amongst many things that's intriguing about bullheads, is their spawning biology. I lifted this stone many, many years ago, and this face was lying on the bed of the river. So I've turned it through 180 degrees. So the stone had a natural cave in it here with an entrance here on the right hand side and there on the wall and the roof of the cave is this egg mass. This is the spring, so this is March or April and I know that these are bullhead eggs. So what happens is that a male bullhead finds a potential nesting spot like this which will be under a big stone. He'll guard it and he'll sit in the mouth of his new cave his home as other bullheads come past he'll find out if they're males by grabbing them and if they're other males he'll enter a scrap and he'll shoo the other male away hopefully if it's a female he'll grab her and he'll bring her into his cave and presumably he'll go through some elaborate courtship which will encourage her to deposit her eggs on the wall and the ceiling of the cave and he will then externally fertilize them. She then varmooses, leaving him to incubate the eggs. He's got the perfect kit to do that because he's got these massive fins, what so-called pectoral fins, on the side of his shoulders, 
with which he can just gently fan water over the eggs. He'll sit in his cave with kind of his head and probably his shoulders out of the cave, just gently fanning those pectoral fins and wafting water into the cave over the eggs. And he'll guard them. So he'll guard them from predation. When they hatch, probably the dynamic changes because they're incredibly aggressive animals, bullheads. I've kept them in aquariums and they are seriously tough beasts. And probably if the babies don't scarper quickly enough, he'll eat them. But it seems they do because, as we demonstrated very early on from that early pie chart, they're incredibly uh, numerous in our southern chalk streams. They're a highly protective species because we have a huge percentage of the world's species, of this particular species, um, of bullhead in England. The second one I showed you, amazing small fishes, is the brook lamprey. These things just, they beg a belief. They're jawless fishes, so they're not true fishes. They're a separate group of animals. They live in the mud of chalk streams. The brook lamprey is not parasitic. Both the river lamprey and the sea lamprey are parasitic on fish, but not these boys. These guys live for perhaps anything up to five or seven years as larvae living in the mud. They are blind. They do have light sensors on the head, but they're functionally blind. And they basically sift the mud. So they're detritivores, effectively sifting mud. The fins are very undeveloped. This is an animal that's maybe 15 centimetres long, six inches. And sexual maturity means that they lose this sort of drab brown coloration. They start to silver up. They develop eyes and the fins separate. So the fins are just basically a pretty crude strip running around the body. But in the autumn, the animals start to look like this. So they silver up, the fins separate, the eyes develop, and these breathing ports on the side of the head become very distinct. Bizarrely, they may shrink in length. So you can, you know, you can find a 15 centimeter what's called an amacete, the larval stage that shrinks to become a 13 centimeter adult. So they start this process in the autumn. The following spring, boys and girls gather together in a sort of mass orgy. So this is a photograph actually taken from the river Waveney in Norfolk. Um, and you can see individual fish here latched onto stones, which are just going to chuck out of the way to make this kind of depression in the gravel. And again, you might see that when you're out on the chalk streams. If you go in, say, on the test and the itching in, in late March, you may well come across little gaggles of um, brook lampreys. They're only six inch long fish, but there could be six or seven of them in the mating orgy that they're carrying out. Any animals that hatch out successfully will burrow into the mud and live there for five, six, seven years until they sexually mature and the whole process starts again. These adults will die after they spawn. I think it's 100% mortality. OK, so this other bit I just stuck in here as a bit of an addendum on the end. It's issues facing our chalk streams, I guess. And it's a real rattle through. It's by no means comprehensive. But I just thought it was quite interesting to put some of this in context. This is the River Chess in Buckinghamshire. The irony of that sign can't be lost on anybody, can it? Because there's a bridge over the River Chess, fishing prohibited, and there is the bed of the River Chess without any water in it whatsoever. So we know, or at least we think we know, that climate change is producing, climate weirdness is producing some very, very odd things. But one of the things it looks like it's going to produce that we're pretty certain of is less water, or certainly more erratic water, perhaps let's phrase it like that, that's more correct. We're going to get deluges and then we're going to get long dry spells. This is from a very aged thing, a 2009 EA water resources strategy, but this suggests that in September of 2050, the agency are predicting that down here on the southern chalk streams, we should expect 20 to 30 percent less water in the river in the late summer. That's a pretty scary prospect. And coupled with that, and this I suppose is a debatable point, but we're potentially facing increases in population. Now, I appreciate this is not a simple thing, but 
I checked this earlier on. Again, this is from that same 2009 water resources strategy, but the latest predictions are that the UK population is going to grow by, compared to today, four or five million in the next 20 odd years. Hampshire, potentially one and a half million in the next 20 years. And of course, linked to that, in a way, is the governmental drive to produce more houses. So all of those people, if indeed it transpires that there are lots more people on our island in the next 20 years, um, are going to need water. And the thing that's a bit scary for me is how much water we use. An organisation called WaterWise produces these sort of average figures for per head consumption of water per day. And in the case of Southern, up until 2016-17, which is the most recent tabulated data I could find, we'd sort of dropped off a bit from our peak of 150 litres per day to 130 odd litres per day. So that's the average per capita consumption. Now, bear in mind that for southern water, and if you're a bit further east, you could be in southeast water or maybe Portsmouth water. If you're a bit further west, you could be Bournemouth water. Somewhere about 70% of our water comes from either the river or ground. So basically, it's coming from the river. At the moment, although there are plans of changing, we've got very little water storage in our water supply area. So we're sucking it directly out of the aquifer or out of the river, whatever it's coming from the river. Now, for me, that is a fairly scary figure. And I always sort of turn this stuff into size of athletes because I don't know if you know what 131 litres of water looks like. It looks like 131 kilos, which is a couple of stone heavier than Tyson Fury. So this dude, who is six feet nine and the thick end of 20 stone in weight, is about 120 kilos. Now, in anybody's book, that's a giant of a man. And yet each of us, every single day, is using, on average, more than a Tyson Fury's weight of water. And in fact, in the COVID times, we've regressed back to the bad times. So 2020 stroke 21, the average daily consumption of water in England and Wales was 153 litres a day, which is about a 30 stone man. It's a vast human being. And in Southern, 70% of that comes from the river. How, you wonder, how does a river survive that? You know, that's not all, because, of course, climate weirdness is producing a progressively warmer climate. The rainfall might be a bit spiky and unpredictable, but there is a general trend towards warmness. And we see that in both winter temperatures and summer temperatures. Uh, Steve Ormerod and his wife, Isabel Durant, did this study of a long term data set from the Itchin. They published it in 2009. So it's a bit aged, but you'll see where I'm heading with this argument. The top one is average winter temperatures. The bottom one is average summer temperatures. And they fitted this regression line. If you look through the top one here, the average winter temperature in the Itchin in this 30 year data span has increased by the thick end of a couple of degrees. For trout and salmon, their ideal incubation temperature is somewhere about 10 to 12 degrees. Once you get into the teens of degrees, 13, 14, 15, then you start to produce lots and lots of deformities. So effectively embryos that won't survive. And then once you get into the mid to upper teens, the eggs will die. I mean, it looks to me, if that regression line keeps on doing what it's doing, that within my kid's lifetime, the itching is gonna be a hostile place in the winter for trout and salmon incubation. In summer, over that 30 odd year data set, the average summer river temperatures again have increased by two or three degrees. That doesn't include the extremes. We, you know, we probably got river temperatures now nigh on 20 in some parts of the southern chalk tree. I was wading about at the bottom of the Meon on Tuesday evening and the sea was palpably warm to the touch. Trout start to struggle, and salmon, much above 20 degrees. 
22 degrees, they really are in trouble. They're quite uncomfortable. And at 25 degrees, their discomfort's over because they're probably dead. So again, you know, if that regression line keeps going, you're talking about a decadal scale before we're up to average temperatures, which are extremely uncomfortable for trout and salmon down here. And then, of course, there's all the modern um, anthropogenic impact, uh, you know, hugely publicized sewage impacts. Uh, this particular structure, so-called combined sewage overflow, is not on a chalk stream, it's on the air in North Yorkshire. But of course, we've had our own issues down here with Southern stories around that water company of discharge of sewage into our rivers and indeed the sea. But we've also with the southern chalk streams we've got a historical legacy of them being manipulated and engineered for a variety of reasons for milling for irrigation through the water meadow systems and through post-world war ii drainage and dredging and all of those scars are still born on the river today so in terms of ecological function something like these hatch systems here are incredibly damaging they interrupt the natural functioning of the river. They stop fish being able to move freely. There are some really, really fundamental issues. And both the test and the itching are riddled with these structures still. And um, we're still doing it today. This isn't a southern chalk stream. It's a Yorkshire chalk stream called the Settrington Beck. But that land drainage, that dredging legacy that we still see in the test and the itching is happening today in lots of chalk streams around the country. From its previous dredging, some decades ago, it had started to re-engineer a wiggly path. The good old local board decided they weren't having any of that, and they came in, this is the winter of 2016, uh, and they dredged it dead straight line, evidently to avoid flooding of a single property in that horrendous, really exceptional 2015, 2016 year. This is a stream that has trout spawning in it. And then, of course, there's all sorts of legislative stuff going on, huge high profile stuff about the Environment Act of 2021, which the government rushed through having the Environment Bill, having sat on, on the books for absolute ages, loads of loads of public pressure at the end of last year, forced the government's hand to put the Environment Act through. The test of that of course will be whether the act is actually enforced at all by the regulatory agencies because there is legislation there has been legislation there all along to control for example pollution caused by sewage and if you wanted to check that out there's a really interesting paper that's written by a solicitor called Guy Lindley Adams who wrote it for the one of our sister NGO Salmon and Trout Conservation UK and he says of the Environment Act 2021, it's no, it imposes no more than a duty to comply with the existing law. So he makes the point that all the legislation was there and has been since the water industry was privatised. The thing that's been missing is enforcement of that legislation. So let's see whether the um, Environment Act is indeed a turning point for nature, fingers crossed. And then of course the water companies. In fairness, the water companies are stepping up to the plate Southern Water is now doing loads. Uh, you know, they got a massive, massive slap on the wrist last year and the year before. They say there's a cultural change internally in the organisation. There are other ideas for water resources around the country. The founder of the Wild Trout Trust, Charles Ranger Wilson, has come up with a brilliant idea in the Chilterns, which is potentially transferable. And he's called it Chalk Streams First. The idea is very simple. The practicalities are somewhat different, but it's the idea of moving the points of abstraction from the headwaters of the chalk streams to the bottom end of them. So you give the river the first run at the water. Obviously, the water industry is a little bit resistant to that because if they can use groundwater, it's very pure. They have to treat it very little. But if they're using water that the river's had a go at, and we've put sewage into, they've then got to do more treatment. But it's a very, very good idea. And have a little look at it. We're doing some modelling work with a hydrologist at the moment to look at that and try and convince the water companies that if they turn the taps off at the headwater, they, the river will actually benefit from that tap being turned off. 
chalk streams first. Lovely idea. And then, of course, there are lots of us, the Wild Trout Trust, the Wessex Rivers Trust, the Hampshire Nile Wildlife Trust, all working to try and put some physical structure back into our knackered rivers. And that will hopefully combat that dredging that I spoke about, the historical and in some cases the latter day dredging, but also things like the lack of trees and the shading that they produce over rivers. So that's what our river restoration is aimed at, is restoring some sort of natural process back into lots of rivers that are currently not functioning very naturally. That's my lot. It's a plug. The Wild Trout Trust is a membership organisation. If you fancy the look of us, you're very welcome to um, join our ranks. It's, it's mostly anglers, but there are others non-anglers too. So thank you all. <laughs>